This relationship among the sovereign government of the UAE, the leadership of ADNOC, and the IOCs has been successful and has made the UAE one of the most stable, dependable, affluent oil producing countries in the world. Unfortunately, not all relationships between the host countries and the IOCs have been so successful. The expropriation of oil fields in Libya, Iran, and Venezuela, for example, have all brought political upheaval. Instead of prosperity and peace, mineral wealth in these countries has brought misery and lost opportunities to many of its citizens and financial losses to the IOCs. Regardless of the risks, as an operator, you will be driven to go where there are promising hydrocarbon indicators, and that could be any place in the world. If you decide that a promising place to drill is in a host country that has a current proven record of oil and gas deposits with the commercial outlets, you will most probably sign a contract to work with the local NOC. If you want to drill your wildcat well in a country that has no oil production, then you will probably find neither NOCs nor competing IOCs. In this instance, you will likely find that there will be no infrastructure to support your undertaking. You will have to do and provide everything for yourself. Of course, this might be a great opportunity for your company to discover a huge new field. In addition, because most sovereign countries want you to risk your money to make them an oil producing nation, you'll find them very accommodating. Of course, you'll be taking more calculated, technical risks in drilling for oil where none has been found before. You'll also be facing political risks as well. It will be your responsibility to negotiate contracts that will not only accommodate your risks, but will also allow the government to withstand the political pressures and honor the contract after production begins with its insuant profits. In other words, you want to make sure that your agreement is generous enough to justify the financial risk, but not too generous so that the government is forced to nationalize or expropriate your assets as soon as you start production. Let's recap. Inside the United States and Canada, surface rights and subsurface rights are owned by individuals, corporations, and state or federal governments. You will sign agreements and leases with the owners of the surface and subsurface mineral rights. Outside the United States and Canada, the mineral rights are owned by the state. To explore in these locations, you will sign contracts with a host country. Depending on the host country involved, you may also be working with the National Oil Company and or other international oil companies. Now let's examine how the needs of the host country and the international oil company differ. Of course, a host country wants to become an oil producing state. To become one, the host country usually depends on the international oil company to discover and develop its hydrocarbon deposits. In allowing the IOC access, the host country expects 1. Technical and managerial oil field expertise to successfully get the oil out of the ground and to the marketplace as quickly as possible. 2. Access to cash to finance the operation and a big percentage of the profits after commercial gas and oil is discovered. For political expediency, the host country wants 3. Preferential placement of its citizens in good, high paying jobs in the IOC. 4. And implementation of a social contract to improve the country's infrastructure for its citizens. 
to be willing to go into a host country, the IOC offers one, technical and managerial oil field expertise to successfully get the oil out of the ground and to the marketplace as quickly as possible. Two, access to outside financial risk capital in return for an equitable share of the profits. In addition, the IOC expects three, permissions to display a physical presence in areas with good hydrocarbon potential and for a promise of an atmosphere of political stability to guarantee and support the business arrangements over the life of the oil field. The IOC and the host country must work together to make sure that the differing goals and objectives of both parties are met. By doing so, the citizens of the host country and the stockholders and investors of the IOC are placated, thus wanting to continue the relationship. For instance, in the UAE, not unlike other host countries in the world, the government and ADNOC advocate for more nationals in engineering and professional positions. This policy, called emeritization, sets recommended quotas for the number of nationals an IOC might want to have on its payroll. Fortunately, the UAE also sees the importance of providing pools of trained, qualified staff to fill these positions. In addition to sending their aspiring students abroad to study engineering, ADNOC has also established a university called the Petroleum Institute to locally train men and women to become qualified oil field engineers and professionals. Because of this positive approach, now qualified local technicians, engineers, and professionals are actively recruited by the IOCs, not only for the UAE, but for other parts of the world where the IOCs have economic interests as well. A national oil company is an extension of the host country. Formed after the host country has developed and then nationalized its oil fields, the National Oil Company works to combine the goals and objectives of an IOC and its host country. Not only does it provide technical and managerial expertise and investment capital to explore new fields like the IOC, it also supports a commitment to good jobs for its citizens and the implementation of social contracts. Unlike an IOC, however, Within its country, the NOC operates as a monopoly. It controls their country's entire marketplace. This lack of competition tends to allow the NOCs to become complacent, less aggressive in maximizing its potential, to be less cutting edge or innovative. They are less interested in pursuing and using the latest technologies with their inherent risks. The NOC is less interested in a mere monetary contract. They are driven to provide social contracts to not only improve the lives of its citizens, but to do so in a way that increases their own and the political power of the leadership of the host country. On the other hand, an IOC does not have the luxury of a monopoly and for financial backing must cater to the needs of its investors and stockholders. It must be able to do things quicker, better, cheaper than the competitors and still get the oil and gas market cheaply and effectively. Nevertheless, history has also taught them that they must also remain sensitive to the needs of the citizens in the host country so that these citizens will continue to support the leadership that has signed the original contracts. In addition, with their activities spread over many countries, many people fear or mistrust these powerful IOCs because they cannot be controlled by a single government. To counter that fear and to build confidence, the IOCs invest in a range of programs that benefit the environment, the local community, and society as a whole. Although both IOCs and NOCs are capable of economically producing commercial deposits of oil and gas, they can and usually do have different goals and objectives.